My name is Laura Gentile. I'm the Operations Director with the Cervix Screening Program at BC Cancer. I have put my, um, I see my slides aren't moving here. Just a minute. There we go. Can you, hopefully you can see that. Um, I have put my email address and phone number up here. Uh, you're welcome to take that down or, or take a picture. Uh, I'm happy to um, take any calls after the fact if we don't get to them today, or you have other questions about cervix screening and the program in, in BC, by all means, reach out and we can, I can answer your questions or connect to you where it makes sense. And I'd like to start off just acknowledge the territory I'm on, which is the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and Salatooth nations. And I would invite you to also acknowledge the territory you're calling in from today. So the plan for this webinar, I'm going to give a little bit of a program update and then I'll, I'll pass things over to Dr. Malhotra from the First Nations Health Authority to introduce a little more detail into our discussion for today and to moderate a discussion with our panelists. And then we'll have some time for questions and answers. So I understand that things aren't presenting as expected. So I'm just going to... Sorry, you guys, I'm just gonna try and present my screen for you here. which it's not letting me do. Sorry about this. How's that? Can you see the full slide now? Okay. All right. Okay, so uh, housekeeping. Uh, I'm happy that all of that was recorded and uh, we are <laughs> recording for today for those that weren't able to attend. Um, I've asked all the panelists to mute when they're not speaking. And for the attendees in this version of Zoom, there's a Q&A feature. And we'd ask that as you have questions that you put use the Q&A functionality. This will enable the panelists to be able to see your questions more clearly and to be able to mark off the ones that are answered so that it's easy to see new ones that are coming in. We will be sending out an evaluation by email and very much appreciate any feedback. We haven't done a lot of um, webinars like this and so would be very appreciative of your thoughts on it, what we could be doing differently or better, and particularly if you have any other topics of interest that you would like for us to um, approach going forward. So uh, a bit of background on the cervix screening program. Uh, we have a population-based program here in BC. It started a long time ago. It's over 65 years old now. And in BC, we've seen a reduction in cervical cancer by 70%. Historically within the program, we haven't actually had contact information for participants. And this is because we've had quite old antiquated uh, IT systems. And also just culturally things were quite different with how things were set up so many years ago for cervix screening. So we've often had questions from people about why we don't recall uh, participants directly for cervix screening like we do for breast or colon screening in BC. And the truth of it is we just haven't up until now had a field within our database to capture participant addresses. So all we could do was send notices to primary care providers on file for, the, for participants. 
and participants also didn't have access previously to their own results. They would need to obtain them from their provider and uh, providers were responsible for ensuring that uh, patients were referred for any follow-up. Over the last year, we've been able to implement a new IT system that's given us new functionality. And we're trying to develop more alignment between all of the three different population-based based screening programs, breast, cervix, and colon, to be able to um, have similar processes like facilitated referral when follow-up is recommended, and the ability to notify patients directly when follow-ups needed, and notify patients when it's time to screen again. So those are some quite significant changes that um, went into play in December of this year. I'm going to share a few slides with you, um, just showing some of the data from the cervix screening program. So this is um, participation rates and by age group and corrected for hysterectomy uh, on average for our target age of 25 to 69. In 2018, we had a participation rate of about 68%. And previously it was above 70% and we've been seeing a decline in participation just very slowly over the last little while. And of course, that we have information just overall on average um, a participation, but we know that participation is not even amongst different um, cultural groups and populations. So this is not um, necessarily the same participation rate we would see in different, uh, in different um, uh, populations. Similarly, we've been seeing a decline over time in retention rate. So retention rate is the number of people that return when they're due again for, for screening. And so we made a change in 2016 to extend the interval for screening from two to three years. And over here, this is showing the, the uh, previous year that people screened. So in 2014, three, the, um, these are people that screened in 2014. And with the change in policy in 2016, some of these people would have been extended out from two to three years. And you can see that since we made that policy change that we're actually seeing a decline in retention rate. So again, a concerning trend for the program and probably also not evenly distributed amongst the different populations. And this is some information about uh, wait times from cytology report to colposcopy. Within the program, we have three different wait times, four weeks for uh, higher risk cytology results, eight weeks for moderate and uh, 12 weeks for, for lower risk. And you can see this is the 90th percentile. So we would really like to see 90% of people within the target and we're over uh, for all of these different uh, wait time targets for time from cytology report to colposcopy. So with the implementation of facilitated referral and the ability to contact patients directly, there's certain things that we expect that we, we are able to do with that. So for facilitated referral, we hope to reduce referral delays and make sure that those that need follow-up are referred. And with direct patient contact, we hope to engage with people directly and let them know when it's time to screen again and to provide another method and again, another uh, backup around making sure that people understand if follow-up is needed. But there are also certain things that facilitated referral and direct patient contact from the program that, that we can't do. And, uh, and this really has to do with the relationship that patients have with their providers. We know that primary care providers are the most trusted source for health information. And we know that the number one reason that people participate in, in screening is because of a recommendation from their health care provider. And we also know that through this process, although we can speed the paperwork along for making sure that people get on to a follow up if that's needed, there are many people that will continue to need and will rely on their primary care provider to understand their results and the next steps. So with that, I'll pass this over to Dr. Malhotra to introduce our, our topic for today and, uh, and the panelists for the discussion.
So um, I'm hoping everyone can see my slides. Um, so I'm Dr. Anjali Mohotra. I am the Medical Director for Women's Health at the First Nations Health Authority. Okay. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the fact that I'm calling in from the beautiful West Bank First Nation, um, snowy and cold and beautiful. Um, the population I serve are the First Nation communities of British Columbia as both an ally and an advocate. And in light of recent changes to PAP screening, <clears throat> how do I ensure access and clear communication to the communities I serve? Well, I step back and I look within cultural humility. Cultural humility is a process of self-reflection to understand personal and systemic conditioned biases. Cultural humility leads to cultural safety. I acknowledge the fact that the entire circle of care is impactful on a person's life and quality of their care. I acknowledge that that is inclusive of results that are mailed to patients. When I look at a client's center of care, they are the center of their care. And within their own um, life and society, there will be many things that impact their care, their journey, the interaction of traditional, cultural, and Western medicine, their family, their social determinants, land, and spirit will all impact someone's health and wellness. And within the healthcare system, <clears throat> I look at it as every single contact point that a person makes within our healthcare system will impact their quality of care, their health, and their wellness. That's from the person who answers the phone when they call to make an appointment, right up to the person doing their surgery. But it also includes documentation. So consent forms that we give patients and mail out results that patients encounter. It's all going to be equally responsible for the quality of care. I acknowledge the fears and concerns that are real that impact the quality of care within my communities. Because from White Fragility has a really on point quote, if I'm not aware of the barriers you face, I won't see them much less be motivated to remove them. I acknowledge that the communities I serve, the First Nations women of British Columbia have a disproportionate impact on, with cervical disease. And I acknowledge the stories that I hear every day inclusive of the story of a residential school survivor who does not and has never accessed cervical screening due to past abuses. The woman who comes and tells me that in her community there was coerced sterilization and she does not want to attend colposcopy out of fears of this. I acknowledge the geographical and systemic logistics, especially at the time of COVID where people are afraid to leave community, even if it is to access care. And those pieces are impactful going forward. Because core sterilization and other fears, they're current. When we look at the Mary Ellen Trapelafont report, we have a major problem with indigenous specific racism and prejudice in healthcare, and it is impactful on healthcare outcomes. So I acknowledge the role as a provider. What are some pieces of advice that I can take going forward. Well, it's that step of being an ally and ensuring that we know that now a referral and information has been translated to her. And so it's my responsibility as a provider to pick up the phone and ensure she knows that her results were normal or that she needs follow-up. Because even the normal results can be confusing. When do I come back and what does that look like and how do I translate this? But certainly it can be very confusing when you see the word colposcopy and you don't know that word and you've never heard that word before. Because what happens there? Why is she going? What does the clinic physically look like? What are the possible outcomes that occur at that clinic? And really important in the communities I serve, there can be fertility concerns. What is going to happen there that could potentially impact my fertility, if anything? And can we talk about that? And I listen and I hear it and I acknowledge it. And as an ally, I try to build trust. And when I build trust, I try to build more trust. And when I'm an ally, I try to be more of an ally. And when I achieve culture humility, more humility. 
is I affirm that her concerns are important to me and it's a long-term process of learning. So I, have an op I ask open-ended questions to ensure that trust continues to be built within this setting. So I ask questions like, do you have experience with cervical screening colposcopy? Does anyone you know have such experience? And tell me about that. Do you have concerns about your care and the possible treatments going forward? Do you look at this as a long-term or a short-term situation? And are there treatment options that you would like to bring forward? There might be cultural, spiritual treatments that need to be blended into this conversation and are as important to this family. What are your hopes when we're talking about a plan? And is there anything I can do to make you feel more comfortable? And then there's that aspect of that circle of care and all the other pieces that can play into care and asking those questions of, is there anything else that you'd like to talk about or that could impact you accessing care? What's your day-to-day -day like? Who do you live with? Are you caring for someone? Because these can be logistical pieces that can impede care. So some practice tips to impart. If you have a blog post, please use it readily. Put up videos and pictures of colposcopy clinics in your local community. Share information about what the changes are in pap screening, um, dissemination of information. And just offer as much information as you can that can be consumed. Written material can often be incredibly helpful, especially if community driven and a, an, in, and a literacy level that's appropriate for a community. Um, multiple appointments can be um, really positive. They can be long or short, but they can certainly be impactful. And at times we often need to reach our communities through text or door-to-door -door outreach, which becomes a team effort for sure, um, but at times is necessary. And then always remembering the role of spiritual care and traditional treatments and weighing that into care. So in summary, um, I acknowledge that all points of contact are impactful on a person's care. The potential fears that someone's bringing forward when they open that letter and may or may not understand what it says and build trust by reaching out and building the trust with open-ended questions to lead the conversation. Frequent check-ins. And offering care in which a way that clients wish to receive it is really important because there are lots of ways that we can offer care and outreach. And so how does the family in front of you wish to receive that care? Always being an ally and continuing to practice cultural humility as best as we can and ensuring that we prioritize nurturing spirit as much as any other part of care. So I thank you for hearing me and I'm excited to hear everyone on this panel. Um, so what I'm gonna do is, um, I think if anyone has slides, they can just help me right off. But um, I'm going to pass the baton to a friend and colleague, Dr. Raman Mann. And the question I have for you, Dr. Mann, is who do you serve? What population do you serve? Who is the community you serve? And when we talk about in particular PAP screening, you serve a population that may be accessing care in lower numbers and might have impacts that you wanna talk about today. And I'm hoping you can talk about how you um, promote accessing care and uh, communication. So I'm gonna pass over to you. Hi, hi everybody. Uh, can you hear me? Okay, so uh, my name is Dr. Ramaman. Thanks, Anjali, for that wonderful um, talk. It was very enlightening, actually. Um, I am calling from Surrey, and I serve um, largely a South Asian population, uh, mostly Punjabi-speaking women. I am. Um, I just want to acknowledge where I'm calling from before I start, from the traditional territories of uh, Samiamu, Katsi, Kwatlam, um, Kwatam, and Tawasan First Nations. Sorry if I didn't pronounce it correctly. Um, so I work at the Surrey Prenatal Clinic and mostly work out of Surrey Memorial Hospital. Um, there is a blended group that I'm a part of, so I am very fortunate um, to be a part of this group. And um, like I said, we do so serve a large uh, South Asian population and um, because I can speak the language, I am actually added benefit in this community. So it's, um, I feel very privileged that I can be here and help these women that, um, 
can you know be marginally compromised as in they don't access the care and don't speak the language so um, very um, privileged and uh, feel uh, very blessed to help these women out uh, during this time. So I wanted to, can you see my slides? Yeah, okay. Um, just wanted to take a step back um, and talking about um, cervical screening and um, just, you know, where these women are coming from and uh, a lot that I've learned in the 10 years of practice that I've been here, um, you know, uh, difficulties that they can have with um, pap screening and um, accessing care. Um, so I want to just go back to the bare basics and talk about, uh, you know, the why women get this screening. A lot of uh, these women I've learned, um, you know, don't have a good background of um, provincially funded programs um, because in India, there isn't much um, routine screening done. Most care in India is um, private pay. And so people have to pay out of pocket and don't have access to that care. And so when they come here to Canada, um, it, it, it's not uh, what widely known that uh, we can get um, funded programming and especially preventative care. So um, I think we do need to do a better job of um, allowing um, and giving all the information to women out there about uh, what we have that is preventative and what we can do for them. So, um, you know, like Anjali had mentioned that, uh, you know, more information out uh, through media or through paper, um, having brochures in your office, having posters, I found was actually quite helpful. And also bringing it up in um, routine uh, visits that these women can have uh, in your office. Um, so uh, I'm very lucky that I get to see these women in their pregnancies. And uh, most of us uh, in our second visit will do a complete physical. So before that visit happens um, in the first visit, we do talk about um, what we can do for pre preventative care. And we talk about pap test screening. So a lot of them will get the information we will go through with um, how to do the exam, why we do the exam, and uh, of course, follow up from it as well. So it's nice uh, if they do have access to a family doctor or an NP or somebody that to do follow. The, the problem with that is not all of them will have access to family doctors and NPs. Um, and again, it goes back to where they're coming from if they have access to getting to a clinic and uh, getting to appointments. So their background and their family is also going to contribute to this as well. So um, many patients in their first pregnancy, um, if it's in India, they'll never even have an, a speculum examination. So I believe this is a lot of where the fear comes from and what they hear from other people about pap test is that it's linked to a speculum exam. And so a lot of them right off the bat, when they hear pap test, they will, say no and will not want to do it because of this fear of the speculum that they're kind of I think that we need to do a better job of um, is training our colleagues and making sure that we're making the speculum examination a lot easier on these women, um, showing them the speculum and um, you know, having plenty of discussions of how the exam is done and um, warnings before um, speculum is being used, I think is quite helpful in my practice. Um, and I've heard from a lot of residents, uh, we get a lot of residents through our program as well, that the way the speculum is put in is not always the easiest way where they're putting it in horiz horizontally and then turning it vertically, um, where I find that, you know, if you put it in the way that you're going to use it. It's much easier, less handling. Um, these women do a lot better that way. Um, and, and I found that that actually gets them coming back and um, they're okay with doing the exams again if, if we need to do them. One thing I had mentioned was the more education. I, I find um, in this group uh, population that Punjabi radio station has been a good place. So if you know people have access to getting social media out there or talking on the radio, this would help this community quite a bit um, to spread the word about preventative care and about doing the pop tests as well. The other thing that I wanted to go back and talk about is um, the main reason why we do this test. I find that um, in this community, a lot of people don't actually know that 
the pap test is related to a test that we are doing for cancer. A lot of them believe that it's um, a test that we're doing to check for infections. So sometimes just having that bare basics talk about this is simply a test for cancer. These women I find will be um, you know, more in tune to doing the test. Um, once they hear that word there, they want to know, they want to know what um, their risks are and they're more interested because they know that this can affect them and their families long-term. So I find that if we go through and tell them that this is why we're doing the test, they're more, more happy to go ahead and, and do the test as well. The um, one thing that I wanted to bring up about uh, reporting, um, like Anjali had mentioned, uh, sometimes even just a, a negative test result is important to talk about with these families. Um, a lot of them, you know, uh, will hear from their family doctors if, or from their care providers, if you don't hear from us, it's a good thing. But I find that uh, in this community, it is good to go ahead and, and let them know whether it's a positive result or a negative result, uh, either way to clearly communicate. Um, and follow up is also a very important thing to talk about. I have heard from women that, you know, once I got this test done, that is the only time that I need to get it done. So we need to go and educate and, and let them know about follow-up as well. Um, hearing and abnormal result in, in any community can be a traumatizing thing, but uh, this one, they have to think about their families and uh, how they're going to get to this colposophy clinic. And it can be um, a lot of fear. So, you know, just simply talking about it and, and step-by-step -step process I found has been the best thing in my practice and what I've done. So the other thing that in my practice, um, you know, I have a wonderful MOA who preps these patients um, and I find that this helps with the procedure and follow up and whatnot. Um, there's uh, many levels of care of people talking about what's going to be happening in the room, what the procedure is about, what the follow up is going to be like, making sure we have the correct contact numbers. Um, I find that helps quite a bit. And for those that, of course, don't speak the language, I think definitely having an interpreter or family member to help uh, these women is a, a big plus. Um, so I think definitely because I can speak the language, but uh, anybody else to have uh, even a family member there with them so they understand exactly what's going through, like any other community, that this is a nice thing to have. Uh, the other thing in this community that is um, a, a big thing women talk about and the reason why they don't want to go ahead and get the testing is because of um, the care providers. A lot of them do feel comfortable with female care providers, but also just to have another female in the room, somebody that they can um, rely on and, and have support with is also quite helpful for them as well. We're lucky here in BC, we have a lot of, um, you know, Punjabi interpretation and um, brochures available, interpreters available. So definitely I would urge everybody to link into them. On the BC Cancer Agency, there's um, wonderful brochures that you can download in Punjabi. I've just attached uh, an example of one of them. And it, it talks about everything in such detail and where to call and what to do. So if we are transitioning to women following up on their own, I think we definitely need to be giving them this information, um, something to take home, something that they can look at, um, at at a later time with their family members is a great thing to keep in your offices as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Mann. That was wonderful. Um, we really appreciate uh, your voice. Um, and, and in particular, I, I really heard that piece that is also relevant to community. I, I serve where the role of family and community, you know, often the entire family and community are impacted by the results. And so having a support person or advocate in the room is sometimes just a part of the process that's really, really important. So thank you so much. Um, uh, Dr. Sue, so I am hoping that you too can answer the same. For whom do you serve? And how do you um, address access and communication within your population? Thank you, Anjali. Can you hear me? Yeah. Thank you, Anjali. And thank you so much, Raman, for sharing. Um, a lot of things that you guys have shared, um, I was going to share, but this is good. I can move on to things that haven't been reiterated or talked about. Um, I have my notes, but I didn't make slides. So I hope that my voice and what the talk, the subject material is interesting enough to keep you captivated. 
So um, my name is Winnie Sue. I'm a family physician working in the Kitsilano neighborhood of Vancouver. Um, and I've been in private practice since 2003. Um, and in, I'm in a group with two other women. And we have a very, uh, so I did all my training here and, and have a very diverse practice. And um, when Anjali approached me to ask if I would be interested in, in sharing on this topic, I was actually um, a bit excited about it because it's just never been something I've, um, I've really considered or thought about, but I feel so privileged and honored. Um, I, um, so I'm Chinese by ethnicity and um, my first language is actually Mandarin, but as I went through school, I lost that language actually for a good number of years <laughs> through high school and university and really only came back to it because of my work. And it, what, you know, I think what it was, was being a female that um, had, um, I practiced obstetrics um, for, for many years and actually I still do. I gave up my, um, my OB call a few years ago at BC Women's, but I'm still part of the care group and I basically follow my patients right up to delivery. But, you know, it was just a realization that uh, there's a huge demand for female physicians and especially physicians that were, um, yeah, that can meet the cultural needs of our population. So I have a diverse group um, because I can speak Mandarin. I have, I would say majority of my patients can speak English, but I definitely have about maybe a quarter of patients who are Asian descent and then maybe about 10 to 15% who can only speak very limited English. And so I realize what a, how important our role is. And, and really, I think coming back to my own roots and realizing just how much I can use my own skills and my own background to serve, um, yeah, to serve the Asian population. We have a very mixed group. And when I say we, I mean, my partners and I, in my own practice, um, uh, you know, when I say Asian, it covers, yeah, um, you know, Southeast Asian, mainland Chinese, um, those born in Hong Kong, Taiwanese, Vietnamese, Korean, Muslim, uh, Middle Eastern, because we're also quite close to UBC. We have a fair amount of international students um, who are graduate, um, who are, many of them are doing the graduate studies. So definitely a very diverse group. And so that's, yeah, so I would say my population is very, very mixed. And then on top of that, doing a lot of obstetrics, like Raman is through um, her surgery practice, um, definitely a huge group of um, growing families and women who are planning families. Um, so, you know, to answer the question of how I've been able to facilitate access and be able to increase access to screening and follow up, um, I had a lot of thoughts about this. And I think a lot of things that Raman already talked about, because it's, I think, very similar in the Punjabi population. Um, I would say, you know, it's it's important, as I think actually you pulled up the slide of what it is that we need to identify the barriers before you can overcome them. And I think a lot of the barriers are around, um, uh, mis, uh, yeah, just misperceptions and um, lack of education. So understanding, so I actually ended up doing a little bit of a lit search, and I think the BCMJ actually reported on this back in 2000, and there were a few other papers after that. And what they found was that a lot of women who oftentimes are lower rates of testing in, in the aging population for women who are older, um, those who are not married. Um, interestingly, those from mainland China, so I think they actually created sort of subsets of where people were geographically from. Those who spent a shorter duration of time in North America, so I guess new immigrants, those not fluent in English, um, those with lower um, levels of education and household income, those living in subsidized housing, and those women with a previous hysterectomy, um, as well as those who um, uh, were not in a relationship. And so, the, so a lot of it then comes back to education. Um, and, you know, I think if we're going to start sort of systematically, I always, I thought of my practice as to what is it that women first see when they come in. So I think, Raman, you talked about it, like having an MOA that spoke their, you know, speaks their language. We've had, um, we've been very blessed with um, MOAs that many of them are trilingual, so they speak English. Um, one of the Chinese dialects, either Mandarin or Cantonese, or many of them spoke both, and they can read and write. Um, I can't actually read or write. I can speak Mandarin and speak some Cantonese, um, but you know, you realize that just the communication part is a big deal. And um, you know, I think 
the the piece of really spending the time explaining to them what the path is for. So Roman touched on this too, like most women do not know what the path is for and from where they come from, um, many of them feel that, in fact, I would, I would ask my patients, so what do you think, you know, do you know what we're testing for? And many of them would answer, you know, it's an STD testing, a lot of them think it's um, for an infection. And I think when you bring up that it's for cancer, um, many of them really do take it more seriously. Um, I think one of the other barriers is around um, just fear of the procedure itself and pain. So there is a high, I, I feel there's a high rate of, um, of I, I don't, again, didn't do a research around this, but you know, vaginism is in dyspareunia and pain in some of these populations of patients. And I think there's a lot of unsaid um, or underreported abuse, perhaps, and that often comes up years into their into caring for them. Um, and so I think the technique is really important. So in our practice, we do train PGY2 residents. I agree with Raman. I think the technique is really, really important. And it's very important for those of you who teach to actually supervise your trainees and really go through the technique. Um, because that, that's, it's not just a path, it's the whole process. It's showing them the instrument and really making it look like, you know, we're using this, we're using lubrication, here's the brush, here's the spatula we use, and why are we using this? And, and, you know, and, and sometimes I even share a little bit about me, like my first time with it, you know, I was nervous too. And, you know, just how do you help relax their legs and their bum? And so I have a few tricks, you know, I ask them to usually stick their bum. So this is part of perhaps doing a lot of maternity as well, doing all the VEs that we do, um, you know, stick your bum to the table and ask them to usually come down. And I find that oftentimes they would scoot up because they want to avoid you. So I always have them come way down right to the foot of the bed. And then sometimes I'll even say, you know what, if you feel okay, hang your bum down just a little bit past the edge. That helps a lot because oftentimes I find that, you know, the cervix is often tilted down and you really do need to actually. So I think one of the things I find a lot of our new trainees often who can't find the cervixes have issues with is that they're just not down enough. And so I often say, make sure the pressure is downwards, never upwards. It's so, it's just much more uncomfortable having anything sort of be close to you, be through our declivers. Just, so I agree with Raman. So put it in the way that you would. And I often will actually introduce my finger first and just check tone and just see how relaxed they are. I use a lot of lube and, you know, and I, I put that word in just because I, I do think that's an important piece. If they have an unpleasant experience, they often have a hard time coming back or they're reluctant to. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's just one, one tip I have. Um, and usually I will talk about STI screening as well. And that's another topic. And I would say that, um, and then, you know, again, for those of you in, who, yeah, have a very um, women's health type practice, you'll, uh, a subset of my patients, you know, aren't with their partners or their spouses, because um, especially amongst the immigrant population where their families are separated. And um, it's, a, it's an important topic because there is a, you know, a fair amount of um, STI risk in some of these patients for sure. And, you know, and I, I learned that quickly in my practice where, you know, women would say to me, no, no, you don't need to check that. And, you know, often they'll say, well, it's my routine that I, I, I will. And, um, you know, and I'm, I'm often catching positive swaps. So that's just another part of the discussion around um, uh, intimacy and their family. And so that all takes time. And I think really the gist of it is taking the time to do this. Um, usually with my PAP smear appointments, um, I also, yeah, we talk about breast health and, you know, so you sort of use that to talk about their general health and then, and, and, and stress to them that you're trying to prevent. Um, so, you know, I think that the, the, the takeaway, uh, some of the main points um, in regards to, you know, my Eden population is that the continuity of care is really important. So when it comes to communication, I agree with Anjali and Ron that um, many of them will expect a call, even if it's normal. Many of them worry quite a bit. And sometimes I have to dig a little bit deeper into why they're really worried about their PAP. Um, and, you know, oftentimes will come out that, you know, they feel that their spouse was unfaithful or, 
the, the, and many of them, as you know, don't have a good understanding of the HPV virus either. And that's another topic. So we spend some time talking about that and prevention and um, even immunization um, around that. So I think continuity of, um, continuity of care. So usually with normal reports, I don't call, we don't call everyone, but what I often will say is, you know, we call you if it's negative. I, we do so many, um, but, you know, we will definitely contact you if there is something the matter. And I, I usually make a point, I, I'll call them and explain to them over the phone what it is. And, and that takes time. And, and then explain to them how the follow-up uh, will happen. Um, the language piece is, is difficult and sometimes because they are very nervous that they're going to a place that no one speaks their language. And so um, I will often, you know, encourage them to bring a friend or many of them will bring their children. So I just had a woman come in yesterday and brought her daughter and it was just, it, it was, you know, and, and her daughter was uh, in her 20s and is also my patient and she was just so supportive and I just thought this is this is great like we yeah you are an essential support person for your mom right now um and so yeah I, I think that really a lot of it's around communication and just they just need to know that you you care about them and that you're you're wanting to make the experience as pleasant as possible yeah so that's that's all I have to share right now Thank you, Dr. Sue. That was wonderful. Um, I really appreciated that you look at what could be the possible reason for someone not wanting to come in and then not come back. <laughs> and so that piece is so, so important in, when we talk about access and communication um, and just the role of the entire circle of care, everyone that is, is, in, is uh, encountering within your practice. Um, so thank you so much. Um, Lauren Goldman, um, welcome. Um, and I'm going to ask you the same. Lauren, for whom do you serve? And how do you work towards better access and communication? Sure. Um, I have slides. I'm not sure if I can. Am I able to share them? Yeah, Lauren, right. Lauren, go ahead and then it'll just take over from, from mine that's up. OK. Um, well, hi everybody, my name is Lauren. I'm the nurse educator at TransCare BC. Um, and we, I would like to start off with a land acknowledgement. Um, TransCare BC is a provincial program um, and we operate on the traditional and ancestral land of many indigenous peoples. Our main office is located on the unceded and ancestral land of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh nations. And as a program, we are committed to ongoing learning about how historical and ongoing colonialism and racism can interrupt and, and affect Indigenous people's identities, including their ability to access care. Um, so I, I thought I would start off talking a little bit about uh, the population that I uh, serve. Um, I provide, I'm at TransCare BC, I'm a nurse educator and a large part of my role is in creating resources for clinicians to learn how to provide affirming care to patients. Uh, and we do have several resources that are devoted to um, providing sexual health care to uh, gender diverse patients, um, including uh, considerations for pelvic exams, considerations for providing sexual health and cervical screening for patients who have had gender affirming hormone therapy um, or who may have had a, a, an affirming lower surgery. Uh, Sorry, Lauren, I'm just yeah. gonna interrupt. We don't see your slides. Okay. So there should be um, a, a button on the bottom where it says share slides. I see, okay, okay. thank you. I've lost that button. Sometimes you have to hover over it depending on what mode it's kind of showing in. It says share screen. Are you... Yes, I just, I've lost all the icons that are at the bottom, normally at the bottom, my apologies. Do you um, want to, uh, sometimes they end up moving to the top if you move your cursor to the top mm -hmm. and hover up there. Does anything pop down? No, I can just see the recording. Uh, okay. Comment, but that's all right. I can present without the the slides. <laughs> um, 
Oh, so my apologies. Uh, I can always share the slides after the fact. Um, I also uh, work in a primary care setting. Um, and uh, the majority of our patient population in this primary care fee for service clinic um, uh, is gender diverse. Uh, so I do a lot of the sexual health and uh, cervical screening for our patients. Um, and I think as I was listening to everybody else present, I noticed that there are so many um, uh, themes that I think we share in common across uh, across uh, what's important in the work that we do. Um, so you'll probably, as a lot of what I'm saying will probably sound quite familiar because it all aligns with the principles of trauma-informed practice. Um, one of the things that um, I find really helpful um, when I am providing screening is to provide a rationale for why the screen is important. Um, many of our patients have a lot of medical trauma um, and sometimes that medical trauma includes having had unnecessary physical exams, sometimes because uh, a clinician might have thought that that would have been a really good learning opportunity um, for them or for, their, for the students they were working with. So helping people to understand why it is that we're recommending um, this particular screening and how it relates to their health is really, um, has been really valuable. Um, I also find it really helpful to talk about what the potential outcomes and related follow-up um, of the exam or of the screening would be. And I have, I, I learned this the hard way actually when I started um, working with more gender diverse patients um, because some of our patients uh, are taking testosterone and testosterone can cause uh, changes in the genitals, including changes in the cervix. Um, so what that means is that uh, gender diverse patients who are on hormone therapy will often find themselves coming in for repeat screening because they're getting a lot of unsatisfactory uh, results. Um, so understanding what's happening and trying to um, use some different collection tips that uh, can actually give us a, a greater chance of getting a good sample is, is really helpful. And also helping people to anticipate that that might happen can also reduce a lot of the anxiety around, um, you know, if we call them and recommend that they come back for repeat screening. Um, I use a lot of affirming or neutral terminology when I'm providing any kind of primary care and especially when I'm talking about sexual health and cervical screening. Um, once I hear a patient start using certain terms, I'll, I'll mirror that back to them, but I usually start off by um, using affirming and neutral language. And I had a couple slides devoted to that with examples, but um, they can be available and they're available on our, on our TransCare BC website um, if anybody's uh, curious to learn about those. Um, but that's really big. I think it really it goes a long way to show people that we're seeing them for who they are. We're really respecting um, respecting them and their gender, and uh, not necessarily using words that for them may come with a, with a strong feelings of humiliation or shame when they hear them um, used in reference to themselves. Um, with regards to increasing access, I thought about this in two different ways. I thought about the work that we do at TransCare BC, and then the work that I do in. Uh, primary care setting. Um, so at TransCare BC, our focus is really to help primary care providers become more confident in caring for gender diverse patients. Um, this is one of the biggest barriers to care for trans patients is just not necessarily thinking that, they're, that their providers will be willing to work with them or, or comfortable seeing them. And in fact, we get a lot of um, referrals from, from providers who just don't think it's within their scope because they haven't necessarily had training to work with gender diverse patients. Uh, so we really want to support people to, to feel like they can provide affirming and dignified care to their patients. Um, so we have a lot of resources that we've made, uh, including some online courses that just kind of overview some really small changes that can be made to intake forms or to clinic setups that uh, are inclusive of trans patients and, and go a long way to help people uh, know that they are welcome and, and considered in that space. Um, and we also, like I mentioned earlier, we have some sexual health screening guideline, guidelines um, that provide clinical considerations for patients who are on gender affirming hormone therapy or who have had lower surgeries and some on tips on how to use affirming uh, or neutral language, especially when we're talking about uh, exam, uh, exams of a sensitive nature. Um, and in practice, I think uh, 
in my practice, but it, also I would say that this goes, um, I, I feel like I would be saying this about all my colleagues who do this work, a large uh, focus is on building a sense of uh, safety and trustworthiness in the relationship between the provider and the patient. Um, and I think that this has gone a really long way um, in determining whether or not a person feels safer and willing to come back to the clinic um, a, to have their initial cervical screening, or B, just for any kind of follow-up in the future. Um, so in addition to providing rationales uh, and using affirming language, um, when I have someone who's agreed to do cervical screening, uh, usually what I do is I start by making a bit of a contingency plan with them to find out what they would like to happen if they're feeling stressed or they might need to cry during the exam. And everybody has really different preferences. Some people uh, choose that they just want to pause and practice relaxation techniques. Um, some people want to stop the exam right away. And other people um, really want to proceed with the exam after a quick check-in because it's taken everything they have to come in today. And they just really don't want to have to imagine repeating this experience anytime soon. So I really um, I let people know that there's, there's space for that during our visit um, and check in to see what feels right for them. Um, I also find it really helpful to provide alternatives to the dorsal lithotomy position for the, for the screening. Um, for a lot of people, that's a very vulnerable position and I've had success doing um, getting good samples in other positions like the frog-like position um, or even uh, some people pr even prefer side lying with a, with a leg up in the air. Um, so I'll often talk about that and, and give people choice. Um, I, I have uh, switched to uh, offering patients always the opportunity to introduce the speculum themselves. Um, and I'd say a lot of people take me up on this and a lot of people find this a lot more comfortable, particularly if they are on testosterone therapy and experiencing um, genital atrophy as a, res as a result. Um, and of course, um, since testosterone can affect the tissue in the genitals, I find that I just, uh, I'll, I'll talk about this with people in advance, but my goal is really to collect a really good sample the first time, just to reduce the need for um, repeat visits. Um, so uh, often what can happen for somebody on testosterone, there's a couple things that I think of as it relates to cervical screening. One is that uh, people can develop a really thick cervical, uh, cervical mucus plug that makes it really, really, like it's really hard to remove with a swab um, or multiple swabs. Uh, so I will usually have sterile tweezers on hand just to really delicately and gently remove that plug um, so that it doesn't, without kind of touching any of the surrounding uh, cells. Um, and other times I've used, I've had a cytobrush brush that I've used exclusively for removing the the, the mucus plug as well. I try really hard um, not to touch any of the cells around the os and just kind of use it to swirl and pull away um, that mucus. And I've had a lot of uh, success with that. Otherwise, it just seems like it's impossible to get a, a cell sample because it's so um, thick. Uh, and of course, as a result of being on testosterone, and I should just caveat this and say that not all uh, gender diverse patients are on testosterone therapy. Um, but this is just considerations for those who are, um, the tissue becomes very friable. So I'm just very, very careful uh, when I'm removing that mucus blood not to touch any of the surrounding cells so that I, I don't end up causing bleeding. Um, the, the testosterone also causes the transformation zone, that little uh, junction between the squamous and columnar cells to go up a lot higher into the os. Uh, so I uh, like to make sure that I'm collecting, often, so oftentimes you won't see that transformation zone um, when you are looking um, at the cervix. And so just really important to uh, sample as though you were doing a, an exam as you would perhaps on a cisgender postmenopausal patient. Um, testosterone also seems to affect um, the, the cells in a way that seems to mimic uh, dysplasia. So uh, oftentimes we see a lot of um, unsatisfactory or ASCUS results coming back recommending repeat screening. And I've seen um, patients end up in a never ending cycle of this. Um, and uh, recently my colleagues and I consulted with a, few, with a gynecologist who suggested that um, if you have a patient who you just cannot get a good sample for due to the being on testosterone, that instead of 
keeping them in a never ending cycle of screening, it would be appropriate to refer them uh, with, their, with their consent to colposcopy. Um, so that way they're not having to come back forever and you actually don't know um, what that, it, it kind of seems like there would be perhaps no value in that person for coming back repeatedly. Um, another, another trick that works for some patients is to offer um, Intra, intragenital estrogen cream for about four weeks prior to the cervical screening. And that helps to soften the tissues that are affected by atrophy and also to push down the transformation zone a little bit. Um, so if, I'm, if, I, if I have a relationship with somebody in a primary care setting, we can usually plan for this. Um, it's, not a, it's not a solution that's acceptable to everyone, um, but for those uh, for whom it is an acceptable option, it tends to, to work pretty well at increasing the likelihood of a good sample. Um, and uh, I think that um, the other things I would probably uh, just mention in terms of uh, uh, increasing access to screening, I think um, updating health promotion materials to uh, be either inclusive of or specific to gender diverse patients who need cervical screening, I think would go a really long way. People often don't see themselves represented in any health promotional material and it just, uh, uh, it's uh, highly gendered and also gives people the impression that it perhaps doesn't relate to them uh, or it's not important to them. Um, and I, I think also advocating for access to more acceptable forms of, of screening, um, like a, you know HPV self-collection or something along those lines, I think would go a long way uh, for patients who really absolutely cannot tolerate uh, emotionally or physically a, a speculum exam. Um, and then other, other patients for, are having trouble but really wanna move ahead with a pelvic exam too, sometimes um, a little bit of Ativan uh, prior to the appointment can also go a long way with helping to reduce anxiety. Thank you, Lauren. That was incredibly educational and relevant and very much appreciate your voice on this topic. Um, I'm gonna move forward with Dr. Petricelli. Welcome. And I'm hoping you can share with us who you serve and how you work towards better access and communication. Hi, Angeli. Thanks so much for inviting me today. And um, it's really an honor to be here with all of these um, great speakers. I'm, I'm learning a lot and, and I'm really have a lot, I think, to learn about language. Um, and I think every day we just have opportunity to learn from each other. So um, thank you for this opportunity. I think it's really important and, and timely uh, to talk about women's health, especially with the, uh, the impact of the pandemic, as well as the, the opiate crisis. Um, my name is Carissa. I'm a physician uh, currently at BC Women's Hospital. I'm the director at First Square. And um, I'd like to just start by acknowledging the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Coast Salish people, uh, namely the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil nations. And it's a great honor to uh, work with all the families here and our um, uh, Indigenous and non-Indigenous families. And uh, we are, we are, um, certainly uh, pressed over the last uh, uh, five years by the toxic drug supply and the, the huge, huge impact I think it's had on, on women's health and certainly on uh, women accessing um, just basic primary health care. And I think uh, we'll hopefully have the opportunity to see more uh, information in terms of primary health care stats on um, uh, access to services for uh, pap, pap smear screening and HPV um, access and so on for our marginalized populations. But certainly we know over the last year, the, uh, the pandemics had um, an, an exacerbated uh, uh, impact on uh, women and particularly um, our marginalized uh, women. Um, on, on FUR Square, this is an inpatient unit for perinatal substance use um, stabilization. We, we have, I believe, over 160 families that were admitted. We have a 12-bed uh, unit. Many are from 
uh, the downtown east side, but also across the province in uh, British Columbia. We also do um, consultative support to uh, the province and um, uh, the Yukon and, and, uh, and at times the territories in terms of uh, phone consultation for supporting um, nurse practitioners and physicians and, and midwives in other communities with uh, um, issues around substance use and pregnancy and parenting, early parenting uh, with newborns. Um, I would say around the, the, the PAP, PAP testing for this specific population that's intersecting uh, with the hospital around the, the time of um, birth, we are seeing the, the severe substance use disorder. So we, we know it impacts uh, thousands of, of women in the province. And, and what we end up seeing on our unit are the really, really sick. Um, and uh, most commonly, the PAP tests have, have not been done for a period of several years, uh, which is quite alarming. And I think there's lots of factors around that. It's, it's um, uh, all of the social determinants of health. It's uh, poverty, uh, lack of food security. It's the fact that um, sexualized violence is so common. Uh, it's a daily concern for, for many uh, women. Access to their children uh, is a priority. Um, if they've been in, in care, uh, all of these things that have been uh, caused by um, institutional colonialism, which um, uh, we have a huge, huge role in uh, reversing. And so paying attention to things like yeah, in plain sight and so on will have a, a big trickle down effect in terms of people's feelings of safety in, um, in being able to come forward and say, yeah, my pap test matters. <laughs> and, um, and, and, and I think, you know, so many things have already been touched on today. Uh, I think, uh, Right from the MOA and who's the face of, of those phone calls, um, having compassion and offering choice. And a lot of, um, of our entry to care is about building relationship and trust. And that's the very first piece. Um, and uh, the initial exam uh, may or may not in include the pelvic, but it might include a discussion about it. And what's your, what's your experience been in the past? And what are your goals and what are your health goals and really just putting choice and control um, into the the woman's hands um, and it's a way of empowerment and I think that that can translate into all of our um, our practices and just ways of of being with uh, women and young women and and uh, and that comes right up from from childhood and uh, and how we how we break down um, societal norms around uh, toxic masculinity and um, accepting uh, of of those types of things. So. Um, when we're when we're able to normalize people's hesitation like yeah that's okay if you don't want to do it right now uh what kind of questions do you have i know i know it came up already that um people ha have misunderstandings around the speculum that it's what's a pap and what's for stds and so on and and just oh oh that's really interesting and providing information and and um we've had uh We've had um, medical students, first and second year, who are now doing some Zoom education onto our unit. So that's fantastic. And, and I think a um, uh, very uh, low barrier for, for, the, for the patients and the women to say, this is what we want to learn about. Um, and they've been asking questions. Uh, I think that's really powerful. Um, Another piece is the, is the team, I think, and having different opportunities. So if people connect with the nurse practitioner in the office or the midwife or the doctor, it can be any of those people who are doing the, the pap test. Um, I, I, I love uh, uh, Winnie's um, comments around really training our learners uh, well, uh, because if the learner's frightened and is just trying to get the exam done quickly, 
that transmits to the patient that there's something wrong with the exam, that it's not a normal part of healthy assessment and so on, and, and that there should be some shame around uh, women's um, uh, organs. And so uh, just, just normalizing all of that and, and empowering that, that process through education and choice and taking time with people, I think, um, is, is really important and, and part of the work that, that we're doing. And um, certainly recognizing the high incidence of, of mental health amongst all of the population, um, the high incidence of, uh, of trauma and, um, and, and just paying attention to that and, and giving people choice and con control is, is really important. Um, we, we started to see the fentanyl crisis in uh, in 2015, where where the drug supply was really contaminated with fentanyl, and that's where the uh, overdose rates in BC crept up from two to three hundred to um, uh, much much higher. And um, in 2018, the numbers were over 900, and in in 2020, with the pandemic. Um, they hit over 1700 in BC, uh, which is just absolutely astounding. And, it, you know, it's impacted uh, women um, uh, very, very hard and in many different ways. So those are the completed overdoses. Um, how it impacts the ripple effect of that is, is profound. And, and so it, it will affect all of these pieces in terms of, uh, of the PAP screening, in terms of the delivery of the HPV vaccines into our schools, um, in terms of how our healthcare teams are uh, coping with vicarious trauma. Um, these are all things that we need to have compassion for each other. Um, and just daily um, human connection and and that can happen in our offices and it's much much harder right now i think that's um one of the things that we're working really hard on is how to connect with each other how to support our teams it's harder with the mask on with the face shields uh it's harder with patients over the phone and how do you invite someone who's calling in um to feel valued uh when their their appointments are virtual and and all of those extra barriers, but we we can do this. It's so important, and and that'll be our challenge, I think, over the next twelve months. Um, one of the things that that we've been involved with um, uh, with another hat that I wear through the Federation of Medical Women is the um, HPV uh, campaign and the WHO global strategy to accelerate the elimination of cervical cancer. And um, some of the goals around that and challenges are for 90% for of girls to be immunized for HPV by age 15, for 70% of women to be screened for HPV by age 35, and for 90% of women to be under treatment for identified cervical disease. And um, if that's okay, Anjali, I can share the link if people want to connect with that um, newsletter. Um, and you don't have to be a member, but it is a um, international movement to uh, support our, um, our cervical screening and HPV vaccine campaign. Um, and I think, you know, as care providers, we're, we're all working together to, to reach all of our diverse populations. Thank you so much. <clears throat> I'm just going through the questions that we've received now. So I just want to say thank you to all of our speakers. Um, I feel like we have a lot of diverse voices here. Um, and a lot of similar messages, which is amazing and wonderful. Um, and a lot of really significant dedication to the work, which is something we should all be proud of. Um, we had a really interesting question in our Q&A and it's to all. Um, and it's about the role of family in folks that are living in multi-generational homes, the, the role of family within relaying results and gaining access and the role of supports within family. Now, if I speak from the communities I serve, I would say family and community are integral in the care. And uh, frequently the results are shared among many within the home. But I'm also cautious to ensure that I have permission for that. 
and to ensure that we're not making assumptions culturally about folks who may still want to have their privacy, not have their, their auntie or extended family or others involved in their care. Um, but it can facilitate care at times where it's incredibly helpful to have support and advocacy. Um, and, uh, and at times it's a, it's a really wonderful thing when relaying information. Um, and I'm gonna just throw that question out to Dr. Mann as well. And maybe you can speak to your population about um, the role of intergenerational living and families. Yeah, it's such a good question and something that definitely comes up quite a bit in our practice. Um, in, um, in the hospital, even for example, when uh, a woman is in labor, I find a lot of women in this uh, community, they look towards their husband to answer the questions of whether they should be getting epidurals or accessing the next step and whatnot. So um, in a way, um, yes, it's very important to talk to the patient and the woman first and get their permission before you're relaying information to their family. But a lot of this can be interconnected and uh, I find majority of the time the women are happy to have their family members involved in their care. Uh, a lot of them will say, talk to my sister-in-law actually, and she will tell you <laughs> what I want to do. So um, of course it's important to talk to the patient and get their permission, but um, relaying the information over the phone and results that are positive, I think this is gonna be a, a difficult thing to navigate that we're gonna to have to learn to navigate with reporting these results directly to patients. Um, of course, uh, I would always wanna to talk to the patient first before giving the information to a family member. Thank you. Do any of our other panelists have something more to share to the discussion about families who live in multi-generational homes or communal living that might be helpful? Yes, um, that's, a, that's a really good question. Um, so in my population of patients, a similar thing to Ram and lots of families do live all together. And um, as many of you might know, a lot of them will come in all together for a visit for one person. And they all want to listen to the information you're going to share with that one person. So I, I think really it comes back to, yeah, I, I would speak to the patient herself alone and explain that and also give her permission to keep it confidential. I think that's really important. Um, I think culturally in many families and, and you know, definitely certain you know, groups, um, it's, it's every, it's, everything is everyone's business. And I, I think it's important for me to communicate to my patient, and I, I do, that this is something that is, is your information and it's for you, you can do what you want with it because it's your body, it's your health. And if you wanna share it with your family, you can go ahead. Now, um, some of them um, will, similar to what Raman just commented, that they'll say, hey, can you tell my husband about it? Or can you talk to my sister-in-law about it? Because she, you know, and I, I think that that would be, you know, appropriate as long as they give, you know, explicit permission. But I do think the main thing for me is letting my patient know she has every right to keep that to herself. That is her, her right, her privilege, that information, privilege information. Thank you, Winnie. Yeah, it's such an important um, line to not cross and make sure that we're ensuring that we, st we may have some ideas of how cultures will operate within our own culture or others. But it's important for us to remember that it might not always be the norm for every single patient, um, but at times can be really helpful. Lauren, I think you have something to add. Yeah, I might just add um, uh, with regards to family, one of the things that we can see from the literature for trans and gender diverse patients is that um, if somebody, especially a young person, if they have a, a supportive adult in their life when they start talking about their, their gender, um, they have uh, significantly better health outcomes overall uh, for the rest of their life if they have a, a supportive adult in their life, um, which would ideally be uh, a parent, but could be, you know, anyone, including a clinician or a teacher. Um, and we know that that really facilitates um, access to care and, and a sense of safety in terms of accessing care. Um, and the, the other thing I would say is that in a lot of trans and queer communities, people form their own uh, chosen family and word of mouth goes a long way with regards to talking about 
uh, what kind of screening is needed. So if there's misinformation, it will be widely available about whether or not it's required or if people need a hysterectomy. Um, uh, and similarly, if there's a someone has a bad experience at a clinic, uh, you can be sure that that will be uh, widely known amongst amongst the community, both through online um, networks and 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 just close networks. And but the same thing goes for positive experiences, or if somebody has a really inclusive and supportive experience. Um, and so I would say that in, in both cases, families can really facilitate access to screening, um, um, but also sometimes uh, the opposite. Uh, can happen to you. Thank you, Lauren. Um, so I'll move to another question, which I thought was excellent as well. Um, if anyone has any pre-screening conversations with their patients about um, PAP screening, um, I know from sort of as as I learn and um, become more educated over time, as we all do, um, I think those are some of the most important times in a practice. So one of the things that I, I hope for in, um, in practices is before we embark on touching a patient or getting near a patient physically, that we have a, an understanding, we have a conversation, we have consent and permission for that to take place. And it really goes towards some of the, the topics that we've already discussed of, you know, how do we make someone comfortable? And, it, and it's talking, it's always communication. And I'm hoping some of our other panelists can weigh in on this topic and what they do in their own practices. I, for one, ensure no one's undressed before I meet them, um, unless they choose to be. And that we have, I sit and have an eye to eye conversation with someone and I step back and I listen and ask where they came from and, you know, that's important. And how did you get here? And that's important. And now, what would you like to see happen? And so, um, maybe, Carissa, do you want to weigh in on that question um, regarding your patients that you serve? Mm, sorry, just looking for the mute button there. Um, it's a great, it's a great question. I think um, a lot of times I'm taking the lead from the patient in terms of uh, what uh, what their agenda is for the appointment and, and building it from there in terms of what their goals are. And, um, if their intention is to, uh, do that exam that day, then, then how are we going to, uh, do that in a good way? Um, and, uh, and asking them, do you want lots of explanation or a little explanation? Cause people are, are, are all different. So, um, yeah, I think just being really uh, cognizant of the of the nonverbal parts of it too, for me is a big part of it because I think oftentimes people are hesitant to say something uh, that might offend the doctor or but you can pick a lot more up from the body language. So I, I think that's probably um, a lot of uh, the communication you know that I do and I and I just try to pay attention to that and. And, and um, sometimes people really don't want to inconvenience the, the physician, you know? Um, yeah, and also just normalizing when it, when it, uh, um, when something's uncomfortable or, uh, yeah, let's just, let's just take a minute or start over, or this is how we're gonna, we're gonna start with the um, blood pressure and um, this is the plan. Is, is that okay with you? So just, I think, being really open about the, uh, um, what the plan is and helping people have choice and control. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave it there. Absolutely. Thank you, Krista. Um, I fully agree. And we see this a lot in the communities I serve where there's a power dynamic that we have to struggle with to try to break down where someone's very concerned about the time that something's taking and the amount that they're going to inconvenience the physician or can they actually say anything in the appointment that defends them or will it offend someone else or, or impact their care negatively go forward. And that's something that we as clinicians all have to keep us top of mind. And there are ways to really right off the gate to ensure that folks know, like sit down, eye to eye conversations, slow down for a second. Then I know within the chat box, there's a question about, you know, salary versus fee for service. 
um, people here, we're a mixed bag on this panel of how we operate within our clinics. But I will say, whether I'm working in a fee-for-service setting or in a salaried setting, time, it's always this burden of time that comes into play that I have chosen to ignore. Because at some point, I just, I, I can't address that there is that burden of time. I need to address the patient in front of me and to ensure that, you know, I have at least gotten to a point where someone trusts me in that appointment because there's to me nothing bigger in the practice setting. And it is those conversations that we have before embarking on care with someone because that's part of the care. The, some of the most important pieces of care that we all operate and understand and value within are those conversations that we have with our patients. And it's often what's remembered from the appointment. The, how was I greeted? Was I greeted like I was an equal and like I had a voice? Something that we hear a lot. Um, does anyone else have anything else like, like to add to that particular question on our panel? Can I just add something just to that? Um, just with the pandemic going on, I found that this has been a little bit more difficult. A lot of the time we're um, not doing as many in-person visits. So sometimes um, our first visit might be over the phone and then our second visit for the exam is in person. I, I find that I had to take a step back and um, talk to my, my MOAs on what you addressed where the, the women aren't undressed and ready to go for the exam because that would be my first in-person visit with them. And um, to say that it's gonna be a little bit longer, let them have their clothes on and we can have that discussion first even though we talked about it over the phone, I found that's not the same as that in-person talking about what we're gonna be doing, getting their permission, and then switching over to the exam. So like you said, it does take more time, but this is very important in these women's lives. And um, you know they're coming through a lot of barriers to get to your office door. And I think we do need to acknowledge that in our very busy days and with the pandemic and, how many patients we're seeing and what we're doing. But um, of course, for them, this is their one test they're, they're getting in three years. So very important day for them as well. So I just wanted to yeah. comment on the pandemic and what we're dealing with right now can affect this quite a bit. Don't have a pre-exam questionnaire, but kind of a first visit before you do an exam, I find is very helpful. Absolutely. Even that pre, like if it is one visit that someone's coming in for because of COVID restrictions, having those moments in advance of embarking on the exam and making sure that it's okay to proceed um, is so important. And, and it's such a great point that you've brought up that in the end, we ultimately, this is a really important day for patients when they come in to see us. You know, it's marked on their calendar. They might've told their friends, they might've needed to get a ride. It might've been many, many difficulties to get to you physically, socially, and geographically. And it's always important for us to step back in our practices and remember that that's, that's what we have to guide our practice with. Um, Dr. Sue, did you have something to add to that? Yeah, I, was, I, I think it's a great question. And I was just thinking about this. Um, you know, I think I'm so privileged to have patients I've known for many, many years. And I think um, in our practice now we have a, well, we have our office um, email account that patients can email their questions to and concerns. And we use it as well to reach our patients. And I think I was just thinking about this because our practice, we were talking about this actually, allowing patients to actually um, somehow send us their the subjective part of the exam, you know, like, questions, concerns, because I think it's actually nice. And so right now we have an online portal where patients can actually book themselves online. They say, so they'll say, you know, PAP requested as I was informed it was overdue. And then they can actually state their concerns. Um, and that's been very helpful. Now it's, they can actually write quite a bit. So sometimes I get almost like a little paragraph while I'm looking And if I feel like, so we are also limiting the amount of time we're actually with the patient physically just for safety reasons. And so if I feel like it's going to be quite a discussion, not just a PAP, but a big discussion about something else, I will in fact call them and actually set up another televisit and we'll let them know ahead of time. So that's what we're doing in our practice. It's not, it's not, um, it's not completely protocol. Like we, it is case by case. So, we, you know, many of us will look ahead on our day sheet to just look at what patients have typed up for that visit. Um, if someone just writes PAP, they just request a PAP. 
Sometimes um, we have a portal where we can actually message them and say, hey, is it just for a pap? Is there anything else you might need? So that's just an idea there. So I'm not, I guess, you know, I'm not sure what EMRs or portals um, you were using, but that could be helpful definitely in helping you with the, the you know, the S part of the, of the SOAP actually in essence of the, of the SOAP visit. Thank you, Dr. Sue. Now we're approaching the end of our time together. And I want to acknowledge that we did not get to all of the questions. So I apologize for that. And um, we could stay here all day. I think the, the five of us feel very passionately about the topic and would love to. Um, but I hope that we were able to offer sort of insight into our practices and the, the communities that we serve and how we do our best within it and uh, continue to practice cultural humility as much as we can within our world. Um, and I thank everyone for joining us today. Um, I am going to check in and see, does Laura have anything else to add today before we wrap up? Uh, I, I don't think so. I, I, uh, I really enjoyed the discussion today. Uh, it was excellent. Uh, I encourage anybody who uh, has specific questions that uh, didn't uh, have a chance to ask it today uh, uh, to email the screening programs and we can help facilitate um, moving those questions along or getting answers for you. And, uh, and otherwise, just uh, I wish you all uh, a good rest of the week and like to thank all of the panelists and Dr. Mahotra for the time today. Thank you. Thank you, Anjali, for inviting us. Thanks for coming. <laughs> <laughs> this is a wonderful discussion, um, friends and colleagues. And this is, this is great to open up to these conversations. Okay. Thanks Thank very much. Nice to see you, Carissa. Evaluation. Yeah, an evaluation will come out too. So uh, have a good week. Thanks. Take Thank care. You. Thank you. Bye.